Welcome everyone to the Winter Enrichment Program. My name is Khalid Salama. I'm a chair of this edition of WEB. WEB is a yearly event that we hold on campus where our students get to see and hear and interact with thought leaders and uh, professors, and entrepreneurs, CEOs from all over the world. This year's WEB is uh, going to be about connectivity. I'd like to share with you some of the slides about this topic and actually what's going on during these two weeks of events on campus. But before we say that, I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, since we have students from all over the world joining us, and we are streaming this li event live online. So what's WEB? WEB is a yearly program being organized at Kaust so that we can actually enrich the experience of the students with lots of information and lots of things that they cannot get a chance to hear on campus and to learn about. It's, this event is organized under the umbrella of the Vice President of Academic Affairs, Professor Yves Nanoum, and it's shared by myself and my colleague, Professor Ping Hong. The event is organized by uh, Marie Lors, who is a web director, and her team, who spend a lot of time making sure that we bring this exciting program for you to, to explore. So this year's web is going to be about connectivity. And connectivity takes so many forms and so many shapes, and it, in, it interwines with our daily life in one way or another. I can tell you that when my parents were studying for their uh, degrees, they were actually communicating with, the, with my grandparents through letters and through uh, tapes that they would record and send by mail. But right now, we can actually use our cell phones in order to interact with them on a daily basis at any point of time. This is the value of connectivity. As an electrical engineer, connectivity is something that I deal with every day where I deal with computer networks and wireless communication. However, this is not only the things that we know about connectivity. We, we have to stay at home for one year almost everywhere in the world. And we needed to take our classes. So we needed to learn how to do online teaching. We needed to be connected all the time. And unfortunately, some students in certain places were not able to, to log in online because they don't have the means to log in online. So we'll have talks to telling us how can we bring the internet to every single person on earth, whether they are in the jungle in Africa or whether they are in the Sahara. These are all interesting topics. Connectivity is something good. It's part of the fourth industrial revolution. It's one of the pillars that chaos is about. However, connectivity has a dark side. There are people who are actually sitting there trying to actually hack into our computers. They are trying to actually steal our uh, credit card information. We'll hear all about it. So we collected lots of uh, talks and topics that we feel that this will enrich the experience of everyone on campus. So someone might think that this is all about keynote talks, distinguished lectures, panel discussions. However, it's much, much more than that. We have live performances. We have actually uh, galas. We have uh, podcasts. We have lots and lots of events going on uh, during these two weeks of events. I'm just sharing with you some of the key uh, highlights of this event this year. And this is a collection of the keynote talks that we're going to be having. All of us uh, learned how that uh, the coronavirus or COVID-19 moved from one country to another. And we have Gabriel Long, who's going to be telling us more and more about epidemics and how the transmission of diseases happened from one place to another. We have lots of uh, talks about uh, wireless communications and the 6G, not only 5G that we're here about, but we're actually going to take it one extra step and start talking about 6G. We're trying to open your horizon to what's next, what's going to happen for the next 10, 20 years. We have Engineer Abdurrahman Adas, who's the CEO of the Royal Commission of Mecca and Medina, and he's going to be telling us about smart mobility and how we're going to be dealing with events like Hajj, which assembles 3 million people uh, on ca uh, in one location every year. So it's actually lots of interesting topics that span a lot of uh, things. Okay, next. We have assembled also some distinguished lectures. These are more technical in nature, and they actually include some of our own Kaos faculty telling us about their latest research. So we have Professor Zhang, who's going to tell us about how she uses AI in order to watch social media and can detect some patterns in it. We'll hear from Professor Basin Shahada about doing Skype underwater, as I fun, the funny uh, joke about it. He's going to be telling us about wireless communication underwater. And there are much, much more events going on during these uh, two weeks of events. 
One important feature that we always insist on having is we have our own students who graduated years ago and they are all over the world. They are our ambassadors. They are actually going to enrich us with what happened since they left KAUST. What are they working on? How KAUST prepared them to actually can conquer the world? So these are five of our, on the right hand side of the screen, there are five of our students who are going to be telling you more about their journey after KAUST and how KAUST made them uh, where they are. Now, one of the interesting things that happened this year is that we actually wanted to connect more and more with other Saudi universities. So we opened a competition about the poster uh, for the web. We typically we use professional designers to do the poster. However, we did felt, let's open it for everyone. And we received uh, hundreds of uh, entries. And these entries actually spanned a lot of different ideas. And interestingly enough, the top uh, designs came from Omul Kora University, and that opened our eyes that maybe we need to have more and more artists on campus because our students turned out to be more into the engineering side of things. So these are some of the uh, winning uh, posters. Now, I'd like to thank our strategic sponsors that made this event happen. This will not happen without the support of uh, Cisco. And Cisco, as you all know, is a pioneer in connectivity. So it's fitting to the, that they are partnering us with this event. And I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Salman Faqih, who is the managing director of Cisco Saudi Arabia. Next, I'd like to thank Samba. Samba has been with us on campus from day one. This is an uh, innovative uh, bank in Saudi Arabia, where they are at the forefront of digital connectivity. And last, we, our long-term uh, sponsor is Modern Architecture Contracting Company. And uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Ahmed Delbalta, who is actually uh, helping us. And next, I'm going to be walking you through through our opening day. Uh, we'll start by a brief talk by introduction by Professor Yves Nanou, who's going to actually tell us more about web and uh, how it came through. Then His Excellency, uh, Engineer Abdullah Sawah, is going to tell us more about uh, connectivity and digital revolution in Saudi Arabia. Next, we are going to hear about something interesting which is connecting cows at the speed of science. This is going to be given by uh, our uh, chief information officer, Jason Roos, who's going to tell us about some exciting uh, things that are going on campus right now. And we'll end with two technical talks about the recent telecommunication research at Kaos, given by Professor Mohamed Salim Alwini and Professor Boon Oui. Both of them are professors of electrical and computer engineering at Kaos. And we'll end up with some closing remarks. Again, I'd like to invite you to disconnect from everything you are doing and connect with us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Web 2021. It's great to see and to connect with so many of you today. My name is Yves Nyanou. I am the Vice President of Academic Affairs here at KAUST. I am very pleased to be with you for the opening of this year winter enrichment program that we call WEP. As WEP enter its second decade of uh, existence, I want to take this opportunity to celebrate its legacy, a legacy of uh, scientific, cultural, and artistic enrichment, a legacy of commitment as well towards inspiring and empowering students, faculty, captains of industry, and our broader community. Over the past 10 years, web programs and activities have attracted a cumulative audience of 111,000 individuals with well more than over 1,000 speakers from the kingdom and beyond. What this tells us is that success cannot happen in a vacuum. Kao's role as a contributor in science, deep tech, innovation, and economic development space is just growing. But we must work even harder to make the long-term goals and expectations of the kingdom and to address global needs and challenges. The collaborative ecosystem Kao's provides through web is an ideal platform for us to start brainstorming solution to world issues and to begin anticipating and identifying those of the future. 
this year's theme, connectivity, is a rather fitting and timely subject. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, has, without any doubt, had a very disruptive effect, and it's forced us to accommodate in many ways. But it has also brought to light the potential that connectivity has in bringing us together and in giving us the tools to collaborate in a multitude of new and seamless ways. As individual, this means being able to connect from afar with homelands, mother tongues, community, and loved ones. As scientists and leaders, a more connected world translates into an opportunity for increased cooperation, which in turn gives us the collective power to better understand and solve global challenges. Over the next few days, this year's unique web program will introduce you to many topics, including cognitive, physical, and social connectivity, advanced networks and communications, cyber threat and cyber security, monitoring and mitigating threats such as infectious disease, machine learning and artificial intelligence, or smart system and mobility. You will have the opportunity to hear from some of the men and women whose work is at the forefront of these fields, the likes of Professor Gabrielle Long, one of Asia's leading scientists and former Undersecretary for Food and Health in Hong Kong, whose research defined the epidemiology of three novel viral epidemics, namely SARS in 2003, influenza in 2013, and more recently, COVID-19. Of Dr. Kui Bi, chief expert of China Telecom and CTO of China Telecom Research Institute, who holds around 175 patents globally and whose interests focus on 5G and 6G innovation. Of engineer Abdul Rahman Adas, CEO of the Royal Commission for Mecca City and Holy Sites, who specialize in institutional and digital transformation, design and strategy management, and from some of Kao's very own, like Dr. Bassem Shihada, Associate Professor of Computer Science, Professor Slim Alouini, uh, Professor Khaled Salama, who work in the underwater communication system field to bring the internet to aquatic environment. And Dr. Paula Moraga, Assistant Professor of Statistic at KAUST, whose research has directly informed strategic policy in reducing disease burden in several countries. To top it off, and besides a variety of other hands-on activity, KAUST Innovations and Economic Development Department will offer our students a chance to be introduced to tactics and concepts for effective interpersonal communication and impactful networking, and they will be able to engage in machine learning and bio-design intensive workshop, of which will be delivered virtually to match with the team of connectivity. And now, without further delay, let me introduce our first keynote speaker, His Excellency Engineer Abdullah al Swaha, Minister of Communication and Information Technology. His Excellency is a skilled senior level executive motivated by a deep-rooted belief in the power of transformation in bringing structure to the chaos of disruption. Over the past two decades, he built high-performing multi-billion real organization in both the private and public sectors. In April 2017, His Excellency was appointed Minister of Communications and Information Technology with a mandate to drive the evolution of the kingdom's digital-driven economy. Prior to assuming his uh, post, he headed the National digitization unit, and he's considered the chief architect behind Saudi Arabia's national digital identity scheme, 
adoption of open data practices and digital entrepreneurship, all of which are essential to the digital transformation of the kingdom's public sector. Before joining the public service, His Excellency was a CEO and managing director of Cisco Saudi Arabia, which remained under his leadership the leading partner in Saudi Arabia and the region. More notable, he led the foundation of UBEVA, a social entrepreneur incubator that went on to, learn, to launch Cura, the Middle East first mobile app center doctor consultation platform. His Excellency holds a bachelor degree in engineering from KFUPM, a degree in computer science from the University of Washington, and has attended uh, an executive education program at Harvard Business School. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Engineer Abdullah al -Swaha. First of all, it's an absolute pleasure to be among the greatest thinkers and doers of the Chaos community. And I want to thank Dr. Tony Chan for giving me this opportunity. Before we talk about connecting the unconnected world in the 21st century, let's take a step back. There are certain leadership principles that we need to adhere in to compete and to leapfrog in the fourth industrial revolution. Secondly, we need to have a laser focus on business models and last but not least, we always have to remember that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So let's talk about the principles. The first principle I would like to call it, we need to move from problem solvers to problem finders. So scientists that have enough curiosity to uncover and to find out the root cause of why certain things happen. And with the abundance of data and AI and algorithms that we have, I would argue that any mathematical problem, we could write a script for it and solve it. And definitely with AI, moving from general AI to super AI, it's going to be quite difficult to compete with machines. And I can relate to that story. So in my sector, when I first took over in 2017, we only had a million home connected by fiber. And we had a mission to triple that by three million and a half homes. And the only way we were able to deliver that with a disruptive business model is by surrounding myself with people who are smarter than me and great problem finders. And to uncover the problems associated with that lack of connectivity, we had to ask the five whys. So first of all, we had to ask why the penetration is so low, because we needed to put an incentive plan. Is that it really enough? Why do we have to need an incentive plan? Because the IRR and the return on investment is not lucrative enough for the private sector. And then we asked, well, why is it not lucrative enough? Because 70% of the cost has to do with the digging and the trenching. And this is when we figured out that we don't have a funding challenge as our top problem, but a logistical challenge and we focused on going to the municipalities and putting a regulatory framework that brought down the cost of digging and trenching, which is 70% of the cost by 50%. The second guiding principle for leadership among the science community for the 21st century, I would argue is having the highest level of emotional intelligence. Because if you sit at the table, and definitely among the science community, we have the highest IQ scores, if one individual caps the intelligence of the rest of the table, 
that will be such a huge opportunity and this is why we need emotionally intelligent science leaders to be able to harness and to aggregate the combined and the aggregate intelligence on any particular table. Third principle, I would say that we need to have more agitators rather than irritators. And let me explain. So irritators are generally people that want other people to do what they want. Where agitators are people are going to have enough leadership to push people to do the things they ought to do, which is a different orientation and a different motivation. So we need more problem finders. We need agitators and not irritators. And we need people with the highest level of emotional intelligence. And those are the leadership principles that I would argue for us to be successful in the 21st century. If we move on from the leadership that is required for the science community to leapfrog and to compete in the 21st century to the business modeling, it's very core. Because I think in today's innovation, it boils down to four types of innovation. You have product innovation, services innovation, business model innovation and process innovation. And the biggest leapfrog opportunity is in the business model, is your ability to connect users and providers like in no way before, leveraging the network effect and the sharing economy. Last but not least is focusing on the right culture. And this starts with the right mindset. We need scientists today that appreciate that the biggest barrier to acquire a new skill or to leapfrog is a mental challenge. And I think we need to foster a culture and an environment for the science community to challenge the boundaries and to leapfrog. So, uh, it gives me pleasure to introduce uh, Jason Roos, our CIO, Chief Information Officer. At Chaos, we used to have to say, Chaos speed. We're talking about very high speed internet, very high connectivity, but unfortunately, people got used to it. People got bored, and they were looking for more and more connectivity. And thus, I invite Jason to tell us more and more about what's going on at campus and what are the newest developments. Thank you very much. As the Chief Information Officer here at Chaos, it is such an exciting time to be here. The theme of this year's web, connectivity, is very timely because of what is about to happen that will fundamentally change the digital capabilities of this world-class university. I'd like to call your attention to the map that's currently being displayed. This map shows the major research and education data exchange hubs that currently exist across the globe. These hubs can be considered the major intersections of scientific information sharing and intellectual collaboration. And these intersections enable scientific advancement and innovation because of the ease of moving, analyzing, and storing massive amounts of data. As you can see, an example of these is Amsterdam, Singapore, San Francisco. These are examples of such hubs, and these hubs form the center of gravity for discovery and innovation and forms the catalyst of rapid economic development. As seen on this map, currently there are no major research and education exchange hubs in this region. This situation has presented a challenge for Kaos because one of the basic requirements to be considered a top tier research university in today's world is to have high speed access via a digital on-ramp to the global research and education data exchanges. Modern science and engineering research depend on specialized high performance networks, which link distributed computing, storage, and laboratory researches resources with research scientists and students collaborating over a global cyber infrastructure. I'm so excited to be here today to tell you that this is about to change. And I'm gonna tell you to stay tuned. Next week on next Thursday, we're gonna tell you about how we're gonna change this picture. So it's an honor to be part of this web and I'm telling you, you're gonna, something you cannot miss next week. Thank you very much.
So I guess I shouldn't be disclosing what just Jason said. We're going to be waiting for Thursday for the big news about what's going to happen for the connectivity on campus. Everyone's going to be excited to hear about it. With that, I'd like to introduce you to the latest telecommunications research being done at Cal at the forefront of research. Uh, we have with me two of my colleagues, uh, two professors who are founding faculty at Cal, Professor Mohammed Salim Alwini and Professor Boon Oui. Both of them came to Cal in 2009 and the early days, and both of them are going to be telling us about their current research and what's going on in the field of telecommunication. With that, I will start with uh, Professor Mohammed Salim Alwini. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Khaled, for this uh, nice introduction. And let me also, of course, thank uh, all the web organizers for the invitation and for this opportunity they are giving me uh, to share some of our uh, thoughts uh, with the web 2021 audience. And uh, in a way to talk about our vision for beyond 5G or uh, 6G network, uh, if you will. So let me share my screen. Okay. So I think you all see my screen now. Uh, so, okay, so this talk is about, uh, you know, beyond 5G or 6G and our vision that uh, we should go towards a more connected world uh, in, 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 a, in a sustainable fashion. And I will try to explain that in, in details. So I will start with kind of a uh, what we call the mobile revolution. And uh, as you know, many argue that the mobile phone uh, uh, is uh, one of the most rapidly adopted consumer technology uh, in history. Uh, this is in one way the result of this merger between different fields like the internet, electronics, wireless communication uh, and networking. Uh, as you know, we use today our uh, phones or tablets to make uh, all kinds of uh, uh, things like uh, you know, beyond calling, we order things online, we access all sorts of entertainment like listening to music, watching a movie and so on. So it's kind of a mind, you know, you know, mind boggling that uh, what was kind of regarded as different services and even different tools and devices just two years ago have been combined over the last decade or so in a single mobile smartphone. Uh, but of course, we, we would like to get uh, better performance, better connectivity, higher rates, better access, and all this uh, in a, a cheaper and a more affordable fashion. Now, actually, these uh, increases uh, in kind of demands uh, and in kind of expectation, let's say, are something uh, that uh, we as uh, telecom engineers have seen constantly during the past four decades. So 1G was in a way the proof of concept stage and it brought us in the 80s the first mobile phones. During the 90s, 2G made us move from analog communication to better quality digital communication with both voice and uh, kind of email and uh, texting exchange capability. Then came the 3G era in the 2000s and with it we moved online and uh, uh, let's say we started uh, browsing the internet from our mobiles. And as we know now in the 2020 era, we are uh, enjoying uh, the high speed offered by our 4G smartphone uh, and the speed that is expected to kind of get uh, even to higher uh, levels uh, and to connect uh, a higher number of devices and machines uh, as we deploy more and more 5G, which is happening, as you know, as we speak. So as you can notice from the slide in front of you, it takes about 10 years to design, develop, validate a generation of mobile communication system. And it takes another 10 years to deploy it, expand its users until it becomes, let's say, mature. Uh, and then, of course, it gets eventually retired so that the following generation, uh, you know, kind of picks up and, and, and gets adopted. So you can easily guess that as we start deploying 5G, uh, we have already started as a research community in wireless communication, brainstorming and uh, planning on what should 6G be. So uh, it's a speculative period of time, obviously, and there has been you know, more than a dozen perspective paper, vision paper that have been published over the last uh, 18 months or so giving their vision on how beyond 5G or 6G networks should push the envelope 
and target higher speeds when we say, or, or let's say or more user capacity or lower latency for a variety of emerging and future application some of them uh, i'm displaying here in the slide in front of you and uh, now i mean in view of that one can still think that uh, respectively uh, we can look at this historical evolution of mobile network and we can see that the initial goal was to bring basic connectivity to users over a wide coverage area and this evolves more and more towards improving the quality of service of cellular networks by boosting their throughput and capacity this explains why data traffic of wireless network is growing at a rate of roughly 1.5 to 2 times a year so if this trend continues the cellular networks are, uh, let's say, you know, uh, expected to handle up to hundreds uh, times more data traffic in 10 years' time, uh, at a time when the 6G networks are expected to start being deployed. So uh, let, let us actually, before jumping into uh, kind of what 6G would look like, or maybe what, how 6G would look like, let us try first to, to talk about some of the concerns uh, or let's say some of the blind spots we think uh, 5G has. So the first uh, concern is related to the map in front of you showing the current worldwide 4G distribution. Uh, as uh, 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 our minister uh, kind of uh, explained uh, in the, uh, earlier this morning, and as this map clearly shows, uh, we are suffering from serious gaps in global internet connectivity. We tend indeed to forget that uh, we still have about half of the world population, a number somewhere between 3 to 4 billion people without internet connectivity. And it's expected that 5G will further kind of accentuate this connectivity divide. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously, uh, we need to do more efforts to... Uh, you know, democratize connectivity uh, because uh, once we bring connectivity to people, uh, they can enjoy, you know, many transformative benefits uh, such as, uh, you know, enjoying, let's say, remote health and education services, smart far farming, uh, financial services, uh, and it can create uh, more uh, and new job uh, and economical opportunities. The second concern is related to the power consumption. Uh, indeed, according to a recently published white paper uh, cited in the slide in front of you, initial measurement based on the first 5G real-world deployment uh, revealed that, one, the power consumption of some bands of 5G equipment is up to three times of 4G with the same configuration. And two, the number of sites is expected to be two to three times that of the 4G era in order to achieve, uh, let's say, a, a 4G equivalent coverage. And this is particularly true in dense urban environments. So uh, this significant increase in the number of base stations and their power consumption will not only accentuate the negative environmental impacts of cell network fossil fuel consumption, but also bring some kind of uh, financial uh, pressure to major operator due to the expected increase in electricity cost. Let us now move and start talking about uh, the third concern, uh, and which in a way is related to this increase uh, in power consumption, which is related to the increase of concern on electromagnetic field, or in short, EMF exposure. Uh, and with it, uh, the concern of the general population about the potential health risks associated with the extra RF emission from 5G base station. Actually, based on our recent study, uh, side in the slide in front of you, we conclude that while there is still no compelling motivation to stop the deployment of 5G network when the strict regulation in place are rigorously applied, we point out the importance, one, to continue doing research on possible health effects associated with some realistic exposure level. Uh, and this is, you know, kind of a topic that has to be pursued by more research in the area of biomedical engineering or uh, medicine. 
Uh, but then uh, the second kind of uh, important topic that have to be investigated, and this is more our community that have to kind of take care of that, is to expand this first work from the device, architectural, network perspective, as well as the health and regulation perspective on how to design, let us say, uh, uh, radiation or EMF aware uh, wireless network for 5G and beyond system. So, on view of these remarks, our goal as part of our uh, Beyond 5G research effort, we would like to address this kind of concern by bridging the connective divide and developing modern green techniques in order to enhance the energy efficiency of emerging and future wireless network to make them more cost effective and decrease their negative environmental effects. So, how can this be done? This can be done in the framework, or one way to kind of uh, kind of put that is to, to, to see it in the framework of the United Nations uh, Sustainability Development Goals, uh, which, as you know, were adopted a few years ago, and which include these kind of noble goals targeting issues related to the environment, health, education, food, and so on and so forth. And actually, uh, incidentally, these goals are supposed to be achieved by 2030 or in 2030, uh, which is the year where 6G networks are also expected to be uh, kind of deployed. So we hope that 6G will address some of the concerns, or let us say, as we said earlier, blind spot of 5G, uh, and more generally the previous generation of system. So in a nutshell, content to the previous generation of mobile network, which are essentially, or which were essentially driven exclusively or let us say mainly by financial uh, profit considerations, it's expected that the SDGs will drive or at least partially drive the evolution of beyond 5G and 6G network. So on the top of the classical kind of pushing the envelope objective from a performance standpoint, one of the important 6G goals should be about bringing global connectivity and contributing to the uh, development of tomorrow digital inclusive world. This means that 6G research effort will focus, will focus on, let's say, connecting rural areas, remote region, low income slums, and will hopefully make sure that uh, this is done in, a, in an environmentally friendly fashion. And uh, we will also develop secure and resilient network as we start relying more and more in our daily life on wireless communication and wireless network. So let us briefly talk about how we can uh, achieve the first goal and start connecting the unconnected. Uh, equivalently, what we are trying to say here, we are trying to uh, achieve uh, uh, full or global coverage without relying exclusively on the deployment of costly infrastructure on the ground. And this will depend on what we call three-dimensional integrated network that include terrestrial, airborne, and satellite communication. So we are talking here about, uh, you know, the standard kind of uh, base station or cell towers on the ground, but also uh, we're talking about aerial networks, meaning by that balloons, high altitude platforms, drones, uh, and on the top of that, we are talking about space network, and we mean by, by that uh, satellites, including all kind of family of satellite networks, starting from LEOs all the way to GEO or geostationary satellites. And all of these three layers of network are going to adapt their kind of uh, resources uh, in a way to respond to the demand of the uh, population uh, on the ground, which have variable uh, density. And uh, by the way, I think at this point, uh, it is good uh, to establish, uh, let's say, an interesting connection with um, autonomous flying cars or flying taxi that are being actively pursued uh, by transportation engineers. Uh, the idea here is kind of to explore uh, this kind of near ground space. Uh, we, as you know, we have been using uh, as part of our transportation system the underground, like uh, subways, terrestrial networks like you know trains trucks cars and so on and the space like of the air let's say 
uh, airplane. But uh, in between, this kind of uh, 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 what we call uh, near ground uh, space uh, uh, air, air kind of uh, area uh, has not been quite a bit explored. But there is kind of plans to start using them for flying cars. So in this, in this context, uh, 6G, 6G integrated terrestrial area and space network will help keep these flying autonomous vehicle connected for control and command purposes and uh, of course to offer a uh, good quality internet connection to the passenger during the trip in these flying cars. So let's say uh, in short going back to this kind of beyond 5G or 6G theme uh, with the hope that we'll be having high quality global connectivity capabilities, we can essentially break this vicious digital divide uh, kind of cycle and enable richer uh, communities to share their knowledge uh, uh, and, and uh, basically strengthen the economies of less fortunate and more sparsely populated communities. So as uh, one, uh, as uh, you know, let's say once we achieve uh, this global connectivity and once we can take advantage of the expected technological advance in the IoT domain, we can basically move to, uh, to something larger uh, than this, in a way, narrow smart city concept to something broader, let's say, like smart villages, smart uh, hamlet, smart uh, uh, suburb, uh, in short, smart uh, living. Uh, I mean by that, that uh, one can enjoy quality healthcare, quality education, uh, and actually several jobs can tolerate employees working remotely with all the progress in communication technologies. So this quality living can be enjoyed without having to move to a big city. And uh, in this way, uh, you know, the coming decades may witness the first global counter uh, urbanization, uh, you know, that... Uh, 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 we have not seen in the past uh, hundred years. Uh, let us now move uh, and try to, to look at what kind of research is being done to address the second concern, which is uh, uh, the concern of excess power consumption and how we can come up with energy efficient networking solutions. So one idea that is being pursued is known as intelligent reflecting surfaces. Uh, so uh, it's known also as artificial radio space or smart radio space. And the idea here is that the wireless propagation environment is turned into an intelligent reconfigurable space that plays an active role in transferring radio signals from the transmitter to the receiver. Uh, this concept is enabled by the so-called intelligent reflecting surfaces in the environment. Uh, and uh, these surfaces are reflecting the electromagnetic waves in desired ways and in a passive manner. So uh, I mean by that, that um, uh, like basically we don't need to generate any new radio signals and basically we are not incurring any additional power consumption. Essentially, uh, you know, these kind of reflectors are acting like mirror, directing the signals toward north spots uh, as illustrated in the small sub figures where we see that uh, without having to add uh, uh, extra power, we are getting much more green coverage area uh, in the uh, right uh, sub-figure in comparison to the left sub-figure. Another uh, interesting technology that's being pursued is visible light communication known also as Li-Fi, which promised to provide optical fiber-like performance by relying on the visible spectrum, which is portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that is entirely untapped free, safe, and uh, basically it provides a high potential bandwidth to piggyback on energy efficient LED used for illumination in indoor or even short range outdoor environment to also transmit information at high speeds. The current uh, kind of experiment uh, uh, or current kind of uh, commercial technology is able to deliver 100 megabits over a range of uh, five meter or so. But uh, actually, it's expected that we can go uh, by the time 6G are going to be deployed to multi gigabit uh, per second transmission in indoor environment using uh, Li-Fi technology. On another front, more energy efficient communication scheme should be adopted for sensor communication, given the extensive penetration of IoT networks in smart homes, 
smart cities and smart factories. So here we can rely on energy harvesting based communication techniques or more, uh, let's say, radically on backscattering based communication, which essentially enables sensor to run in a battery free fashion. Uh, you know, th this concept uh, relies on uh, uh, basically retro reflecting ambient RF signals using, let's say, on off modulation type scheme without the need of any active RF transmission. Uh, finally, uh, one last approach, uh, uh, which kind of achieve uh, considerable energy efficiency gain is to uh, uh, limit, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, the, 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 the network operation uh, by uh, relying, first of all, on um, more renewable energy generator on the site of the base station. And this is particularly critical in some rural remote environment where the power grid is either unavailable or not reliable. Uh, and this is also anticipated to be uh, kind of popular for urban environment where this can be combined with uh, on-off switching of networks uh, where green mobile network uh, can collaborate, uh, green mobile operator, let's say, can collaborate uh, among themselves, uh, can also do some renewable energy exchange and even cooperate with the smart grid. So uh, there are many approaches that are being pursued in this kind of area and that we are studying here at KAUST, uh, that we hopefully can be adopted to reduce the energy bill and correspondingly the CO2 emission of mobile operators. Let me now uh, conclude by talking about EMF-aware uh, cellular networks. Uh, and uh, what we are trying to do here, we are trying to uh, minimize the uh, basically EMF radiation, and something that uh, people uh, maybe kind of tend to not realize that most of the EMF exposure that we are getting, we are getting it from the, uh, not from the base station or not from the downlink, we are getting it actually mostly from our own smartphone or tablet. So our solution uh, is based on decoupling the uplink and downlink, which means we can keep receiving our information through kind of a base station downlink, but making the uplink as friendly from an EMF perspective as possible by making the uh, uh, receiving kind of base station mobile uh, using tethered drones. Uh, and this tethered drone can place themselves as close as possible to the user in a way that this user will be transmitting at minimal power. To make a long story short, you know, it involves quite an interesting uh, uh, optimization problem, but using this approach, we show that uh, we can reduce quite a bit, about 50%, the amount of EMF exposure uh, when you do this decoupling in comparison with an approach where basically uh, we are uh, uh, using standard uh, base station for uplink and downlink. One final remark uh, that I would like to, to, to conclude with uh, is the resilience of the network. As we know, uh, we, 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 we would like future network to be more and more resilient. And in this context, uh, we are talking about this context, the, the concept of network in a box or pop-up networks. So, which means that uh, we should be able to keep connectivity even uh, after disaster, even if we have like an, an overload where basically you have a concert, you have an event that is uh, very popular. Uh, you are uh, sending people to, in the middle of nowhere uh, in some kind of uh, defense operation where basically you are operating also in uh, uh, you know areas where there is no um, uh, population, you should be able to establish your network anywhere in the world and quickly. So this kind of concept of pop-up network or network in the box requires research in how to establish quickly a back hole, how to quickly have access to spectrum in a particular area of deployment, how you can have uh, power uh, to, to help you kind of uh, run your network and all of this has to be done quickly uh, because you don't want to, you want your network to be resilient and you want to maintain connectivity all the time. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and let you reflect on this uh, interesting uh, quote uh, made by Nikola Tesla 100 years ago. Uh, it's one of my favorite inventor and visionary. Uh, he kind of uh, 
uh, had a very interesting vision and uh, we can see that uh, 5G in a way and, and 6G uh, is a perfect uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, in, in a way is a reflection of uh, what uh, Tesla uh, had imagined uh, 100 years ago. Thank you again. And I would like to give now the floor to my colleague, Professor Boon Oi, who will talk about uh, uh, research being done at Kaos in the area of uh, underwater optical wireless communication. Boon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Slim. Um, let me start by sharing my slides. Hope you can see my slide. Um, see my slide now. Right. Thank you again, Slim. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the research activity at CALS uh, regarding the underwater wireless optical communication. Professor Slim Aluni was talking about 6G innovations, and we know that 6G innovations will connect all things and uh, all things on the ground and above. And um, at CALS, we aim to bring internet to underwater and to enable the internet of underwater things. And we call it IOUT. As you can see, we begin to have a lot of activities um, happen in under underwater um, uh, now. If you look at the, if you look at various um, technology for underwater com, uh, acoustic is still the main technology, and acoustic communications will be able to reach relatively um, uh, long range. Uh, up to about a few tens of kilometers or so. Um, but there is a, a shortfall of this technology because the bit rate, meaning the data rate is relatively uh, low, which only limited to about a few kilobit per second. And radio frequency that we're using right now um, to connect most of our portable devices and mobile devices in underwater medium uh, is highly lossy. So um, most of the the transmission distance is very much limited to a few meters up to 10 meters or so. Um, in around year 2000 or so, we begin to see um, LED being used to send very high, relatively high bit rate signal in underwater and up to a few tens of uh, meter. Um, beginning in year 2000 and uh, 10 or so, about uh, 10, 15 years or so, um, cows begin to, about 10 years ago, uh, cows begin to work on narrow beam laser based technology that can reach um, deeper oceans up to 100 meters and being able to get to um, gigabit per second. So what does it mean by gigabit per second? Gigabit per second means that we now have a technology that being able to well, the technology that is at least have a um, data rate that is a few tens to uh, 100,000 times better than the acoustic technology. Another thing that Slim was, talk, uh, was mentioning is the latency, meaning the delay in signal getting to from one point to another. By using acoustic method, um, we be able to get to, well, is, uh, the delay is about in a second or so. Uh, if you're talking about sending a sound wave to one kilometers range, but for light wave, um, it only takes around uh, three microseconds, which again is a few tens of thousands times better than or faster than the acoustic wave. At Kals, we are using the visible light for these uh, applications. So why visible light? If you look at the um, sunlight in the open oceans, uh, this is this will give you the penetration depth and how deep can sunlight um, uh, uh, reach in open ocean, which is clear oceans, uh, which is the blue color will be able to reach about 200 meters depth, uh, deep or so. And in coastal water and harbor water, which is a bit turbid, turbid means that you have a lot of particles, a lot of um, scatter sources in the water medium 
the blue co uh, green color light which is longer wavelength than blue apparently uh, uh, um, um, 550 or so nanometers wavelength will be able to reach up to about 50 meters and for harbor which is uh, highly turbid will still be able to use a uh, longer slightly longer which is yellow color light to get to um, a few tens of meters and since yellow laser is not available in our research um, we very much focus on blue and green wavelength uh, in our applications. So what are the applications uh, um, uh, for underwater optical uh, communications? Uh, the first is oil explorations because we do have a lot of devices, equipment in underwater now, and those all need um, to be properly mo monitored and connected. Um, the pipeline, um, the ROV, um, AUV, as far as uh, the equipment tools, etc., need to be properly communicated uh, to increase the safety and also to make the entire operations more autonomous. Uh, fishery monitoring as well, we begin to see a lot of activities, particularly in countries such as Norway, they have their salmon farm going to the deeper oceans. And every single cage that you're seeing here uh, is having a diameter of about 50 meters and the depth is about 100 meters and that needs to be properly monitored for pollutions and for any damaging of their cages as well as the uh, parasites on, the sh on, on, on fish. Our scientific studies and other um, uh, big applications um, military applications, environmental pollutions, and uh, climax monitoring, for example. Those all um, need to be properly monitored and require a lot of bandwidth in order to um, enable such applications. Other new applications will then include um, such as the LiDAR applications, while LiDAR uh, after all, we know it to map the entire sea floor, for example, by using this technology, we know that we need light and uh, light based technology. After all, L, the first cat, uh, letter for this technology stand for light. And we also know that uh, people would begin to many country um, begin to store the nuclear waste, for example, and even um, the CO2 storage, they are now go underground and are past the underwater and etc. So those uh, would require a lot of monitoring um, to avoid any disaster and pollutions to the oceans. And uh, large bandwidth optical wireless op uh, communications will then enable such uh, applications. At Kaos, we have been, there are a couple of, um, there are many groups, several groups has been working on IOUT sensor uh, for example, Professor Yugen Kosal uh, has been uh, deploying magnetic sensor and um, graphene-based sensor uh, to monitor fish and sea mammal. And uh, Atif, Professor Atif Shami is working on flexible uh, antenna. Then we have Professor Mohammad Hussein is working on the marine skin, for example. And we also have uh, Professor Xiang Liangchang. Uh, has been deploying AI uh, to monitor marine mammal. For communications technique, while well, we have many of those devices uh, being placed in underwater and integrating all those uh, devices and sensors together, we need communication system. And in communications technology, um, we do have um, Professor Lima Luni, Basim Shahata, uh, Professor um, Maram Relek, and Khalis Lama and myself working on such technology. And the aim is still very much hope to be able to provide band, uh, broadband communications to integrate such a device and sensor together and um, then properly communicate to the, um, to the base station, to the stations or to the, um, the desk, so-called, um, on the ground. Yeah, a couple of key milestones for optical wireless communications. Um, the inventions of LEDs in the early 90s and uh, would whole begin to use LED to monitor the hydrothermal vents, for example, the temperature 
of uh, the uh, hydrothermal uh, by using um, LED technology, place the simply place the uh, transceiver probe with the temperature sensor close to the van. And since by getting the ROV close to the van will be quite dangerous. So keep a distance and being able to pick out the signal. So those happened in uh, 2004. 2008, this I call as a milestone as well because it's the first technology that's um, uh, demonstrated by Space and uh, Navy Warfare System Center in uh, San Diego. Um, it's the first technology that break the one gigabit per second uh, barrier. Uh, their system is somewhat cumbersome because this laser that they're using is not um, it's the so-called DPSS laser, and they need a external modulator to get to this bit rate. Um, in 2015 is the year that um, cows enter the underwater comp, and we also begin to see uh, Woodhull begin to use LED and uh, laser diode, LED stands send for laser diode here, um, integrate this capability into their mini submarine. And 2017, uh, MIT Lincoln Lab adopt uh, our technology, the technologies uh, that we developed in cows. That is the narrow beam laser communications technology in one of their um, deployment. So what are we doing at cows? Cows um, starting in, we begin to publish uh, underwater, underwater wireless optical comm uh, research in 2015, um, the first paper that we uh, reported by using laser-based underwater comm, um, we hit about two gigabit per second. And in the same year, we break uh, our own record again by uh, developing the system, by ramping the system bit rate or data rate up to about five gigabit per second. Um, in 2016, we begin to uh, develop a system that will be able to reach a longer distance. And at that point, 20 meter links is um, the record that we are first developed in uh, uh, developing cows. 2017 onward, we begin to look into um, various different, the channel effect uh, on the link. So the water channel, for example, we study the bubble. If there's a net bubble, it's um, and um, whether this bubble will affect the the underwater link. We also study the turbulence, the salinity, and also the temperature gradients, etc. So um, this all happened in 2017 to 2018. Uh, Basim Shahata and uh, his student, uh, Ab Abdullah Al uh, Khalifi, um, transmit, begin to work on transmitting video and video streaming um, in underwater uh, in 2017 as well. Then we begin to look into whether or not we'll be able to, instead of using the point-to-point -point connections to reach such a bit uh, high bit rate, can we use non-line of sight, meaning if you have two systems without, without connecting point-to-point, uh, -point, can we still send certain signal and we begin to work on those and uh, report those work in 2018. In 2019, we work on something uh, even more challenging, and we try to uh, transmit the signal from the water passing the wavy uh, the wave to the surface, so that we be able to send a drone ideally to pick out the signal without sending a ROV um, to underwater to pick out the informations. In the next few minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, high performance devices and system that we developed uh, for in uh, uh, at COWS for data rate enhancement for uh, distance extensions. So can reach up to a longer distance as well as for um, uh, mitigating the positions, acquisitions and tracking. This is the laser that we built in uh, our labs, in this laser, we try to create a laser that fall onto the so-called Frankhofer line. Frankhofer line is the missing spectrum from the sunlight. So by being able to 
have a very narrow line width or the so-called very narrow spectrum width laser fall directly onto the Frankhofer line. We can filter off a lot of noise <clears throat> from the sunlight, for example, and doing so we'll be able to um, get low noise transmissions at very high bit rate. This is the laser that we make. And in fact, the laser is not any bigger than our, the width of the laser is not any bigger than our hair diameter, which is uh, less than 100 micron or so. And we work on it on two wavelengths. One is blue, the other one is green color. And we managed to get a very a record high bit rate, which is about 10 uh, gigabit per second or so by using this device. We also work on photo detector. So photo detector as a receiver um, for high speed receiver. To get high speed, we need to reduce the size of the photo detector, but reduce the size of the photo detector makes life really difficult for us to align um, the laser beam, which is from the transmitter to the receiver end. And we make the array form so that we're able to enlarge the detection surface once we detect the strongest optical power from the transmitter, we then switch other uh, element into energy harvesting element. Um, we also um, um, uh, obtain a very high bit rate of three gigabit per second or so by using photo detector that fabricated, that's being fabricated in the lab. Other um, photo detector or receiver that we make um, in this case, for example, there is no such thing called high speed photo detector at UVC wavelength because UVC is being filtered off uh, by our ozone. So we call it as the solar blind by transmitting UVC, although it's quite a, a dangerous source, but if you, you can imagine that we transfer from the surface to the satellite without passing, without uh, hitting on human skin, for example, it should be a safe communications method. And since our sun spectrum that arrive on our um, earth without UVC, so ideally, you'll be able to send UVC signal um, without being absorbed. And in this case, um, we develop a high-speed photo detector that be able to handle up to a few tens of megabit per second um, by using the color converting uh, method. Simply, we convert the UVC light into green color light so that a standard silicon photo detector would be able to detect um, the, um, the signal. We also develop a so-called, um, by using the uh, scintillating fiber for detector, for example, we enlarge the detecting surface so that we do not need to have a very accurate alignment as well. Um, and uh, the technique is that by creating such a ribbon, once light hit onto the um, the fiber ribbon, it will be converted to other uh, wavelength light and being guided to a very small photo detector that is again with the aperture size that uh, maybe a few times larger than a hair diameter for high speed uh, detections. Currently, we also develop mimicking uh, flies eyes, the compound eyes from uh, fly. We make um, uh, multiple pixels using optical fiber to increase the field of view so that be able to detect at broader angle um, without precisely align the um, transmitter signal to the receiver end. Um, I'm going to go through very quickly about the high speed um, communication system that we developed uh, in the lab. To get into longer distance throw, um, we have been working on laser and with uh, laser, white laser for both lighting and for uh, communication purposes. Uh, this is actually me holding the laser light bulb and uh, shine it up to about 30 meters up high. Um, and this is again the laser light beams that we throw towards the uh, innovation center, for example. And the throw distance that we're able to reach now is uh, about 100 meters, uh, sorry, one kilometers. Um, by using this technique, we make our laser light that can throw um, beyond 30 meters range to the receiver end for uh, 2K real-time um, digital video streaming. And this 30 meters is actually one of the uh, record because we do not necessarily need to align the uh, transmitter signal and the receiver signal into a straight line because uh, it's the, um, the so-called diffuse line of sight 
and we do have about 70 or 17 degree uh, of divergence angle to place our uh, photo detector at. Um, using this technology, we deploy it to the underwater ambient by having the um, using the ROV to carry our receiver and the transmitter is anchored down so that be able to make the transmissions in underwater um, and come very close to a gigabit per second. And in this case, we demonstrated the 800 megabit per second speed rate. We also deployed many of those uh, uh, ROV and the transceiver systems to real water. This is after um, a very heavy sandstorm in cows, and we can see that the water is very turbid. We just want to uh, test out whether un under a very highly turbid water, can we still establish a good link? And in this case, we managed to get two meters, and the uh, link is still established at about one megabit per second. We talk a little bit about the um, transmissions through the interface of water and air. And in this case, we have our laser system and transmits towards the space so that our drone um, will be able to pick out the signal. And we get multiple tens of uh, megabit per second through the 5.8 meters, which is about air is about uh, 3.5 meter and uh, underwater is 2.3 meters high. We also, um, Professor Lim was talking about the um, energy efficiency. We try to make our system um, cell power, basically power by using either sunlight or by using uh, any light. Um, so in this case, we use solar cell as both receiver and uh, transmitter. The um, um, transmitter scene is ready transmitting white color light and be able to um, pass energy to the receiver end for the um, the sensing or the uh, communication system placed underwater. Uh, Khalis Lama, Professor Khalis Lama's group has been working on a technology called simultaneous light information and power transferring underwater. In this case, be able to wake up the probe by using either drone and or by using ROV that uh, the sensor is placed in underwater and it again is another cell power mechanism that be able to um, uh, do it. Basically power is then transferred uh, to wake up the sensor and to also power up the sensor. <clears throat> this is the system that we built for the so-called visible light communications. Um, we have the so-called Li-Fi instead of Wi-Fi. We have using light to do the Wi-Fi um, in the lab and um, to, to work on the internet link point to point. This is only one to one link. And if you compare our technology at Kaos, uh, this system gives us about two gigabit per second and transmission distance is above 100 meters. And the rest are other startups all over the world. And some of those has just been acquired by uh, Sigmi Flight, for example, Firefly <clears throat> acquired by Sigmi Flight. That is the Philip Lighting. Uh, on the same technology. And because we are uh, sort of leader in the field, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, um, we decided to start up a company called Sonor um, to, to commercialize this technology. Um, Professor Lim talked a little bit about this thing. We launched uh, Echo 5 um, in underwater and Lockheed Martin, we currently shift a system to Lockheed Martin um, by using one single router that be able to communicate with um, multiple clients. Uh, in this case, we use two as a proof of concept and manage to get uh, all of those are uh, uh, link using uh, light-based technology, manage to get 100 megabit per second. Uh, I'd like to point you to the latency. By using light, we manage this, this technology, we manage to get about two milliseconds of latency as compared to our Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi currently gives us about 40 milliseconds or so, which is um, a few tens of times uh, slower than what we are doing. The, well, in order to establish a network, the sensor network, we uh, do have a single base stations and uh, trying to talk to uh, three different sensor nodes for different, um, uh, that be able to give us information about the temperature of water, salinity, conductivity, and pH. And um, those will then prove that um, be able to use um, 
to establish a sensor network in underwater. Ultimately, we hope to be able to link um, the space, the uh, ground um, to oceans and underwater by using uh, optical wireless communication technique. And with this, I'd like to close and thank you all for your attention. Okay, uh, we are excited to hear about these new technologies coming out from KAUST in the field of uh, telecommunications. And I'm glad to welcome Professor Tony Chen, President of KAUST, who would like to share with us some information about how he feels about web, what he thinks about web as an enrichment program for the students. So with that, uh, please welcome Professor Tony Chen. Uh, hello, can you hear me? First of all, yes, we can hear you, Tony. Can you hear I me? Mean, like... Hello, yes, we can hear you. You can hear me, uh, right? Hello, can you hear me? First of all, okay, yes. I think can I can. Yeah, can you hear me? Like... Yeah, 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 okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, 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 should, I should apologize. We can hear you. Okay. You can let, let, me, let me mute myself. Okay, how do I mute myself? Okay. Okay, okay. Me... I think I can. Yeah, can you hear me? Like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, 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 should, I should apologize. Okay, I should first uh, apologize for uh, being late in joining, but I was actually in the waiting room uh, for the last hour. Uh, so I've been trying following the talks, uh, uh, live stream and so on. But anyway, uh, my intention is to just give a general welcome and tell you my personal perspective on, uh, on web. Uh, uh, I have known about web actually since before I joined Kaos about two and a half years ago because uh, I've heard about this. When I first heard about this, I thought this is a unique event. In fact, after I arrived at Kaos, uh, getting myself more familiar with web and the history, I found this is really a unique, I would say, signature event for Kaos. I, I do not know of any other you know, university that have, a, have an event close to what Kaos is doing. Uh, let me explain. So, uh, you know, if, if you look at, first of all, we've been doing it since the day one. We, uh, since 2010. In fact, this uh, version is the 11th, if I understand. Okay. And the way, the reason I know is, I don't know whether you can see this. There's now a book called the 10 year anniversary uh, edition of web. So there's a whole history there. And you can look through it. Uh, you will see, and is, you will see actually even based on this morning's talk, it has, first of all, features the research uh, and, and talks given by our own faculty and other people at KAUST. It features uh, actually many distinguished speakers from around the world, actually, uh, scientists, engineers, researchers, uh, innovators, founders of startup companies, Nobel laureates, uh, actually broader than that, artists, uh, musicians, uh, authors, uh, and so on and so forth. It's for a university event like this is actually uh, quite amazing. And, and uh, I should really take the opportunity and thank the people at Cows who have been uh, putting this together. Uh, you have the two uh, co-chairs, Professor Salama and Professor Hong. And of course, the people, and of course, our VPAAs, uh, Yves Yanou has been really uh, supporting this. And of course, the staff, uh, uh, Mary Lohr, has been uh, really doing a lot of work. Putting this together is no small feat. 
they start basically the day after this program is is over they start to do the next one basically that's the the idea uh so this event uh you look at this book that i just shown it has some amazing statistics which i did not know for example since 2010 we have had 1400 speakers 1800 events it uh, has almost 3,000 students who have participated. We had over 100,000 visitors. So this is, of course, pre-pandemic, when people can actually visit the event physically at KAUST. And the amazing statistic is 2 million online audience per year. So this is actually quite amazing. Now, it's uh, web is, my understanding, is designed originally for students of KAUST. Even for students of KAUST, they are required to take this and they get credit for it. But if you look at the program, it's actually accessible to everybody, anywhere in the world, to log in, okay? Because they are very general. Because now with this year, because of the pandemic, we're doing this uh, virtually for the first time, and it makes it actually easier to, to make it accessible to everybody, right? All you need is a link, and you can go to YouTube live stream. Uh, the theme this year is actually very timely. It's called uh, connectivity. Uh, now, let me mention, uh, I, since I've been here, I've been involved or informed about three uh, web. 2019 was the first one I was informed. The, the theme was called time. Okay, like time, you know, <laughs> your watch, okay, and so on. Uh, it's quite amazing. The topic ranged from the physical, in physics, the concept of time. You know, talking about Einstein. I remember someone coming from CERN to popular science writers to... to uh, you know, just uh, in public, in society, what, what time means, okay? The next one uh, last year uh, was on personalized medicine. And I remember that. It uh, involves uh, information technology, healthcare, biological sciences. And this year is connectivity. And connectivity can mean different things. Uh, you heard from Jason Roos earlier today about that we'll be announcing next week a big connectivity project at Cows. Uh, I will let him, uh, uh, I don't want, want to steal the thunder, so to speak. You have to wait a week for that to be announced. Uh, and of course, especially in this pandemic year, connectivity has a special meaning, has taken on a special meaning. Like right now, we are connected over the internet, uh, uh, basically all over the world. And I've been spending my day uh, basically connecting with people all over the world on various platforms. Uh, to do uh, uh, meetings. Uh, you heard from uh, uh, Slim and Boone talking about the research going on at Kaos about how in terms of electronic communication, how that helps the world in terms of uh, communication and connecting us, both in the air, going from 5G to 6G and beyond, and also even underwater, right? So uh, going on uh, to do that, brave new world, so to speak. Uh, now, I, maybe I should uh, tell you a little bit about my personal experience. And most of the students here probably, they, they don't have the experience of living in a world without the internet. Okay? So connectivity uh, is a given. It's a birthright. But even the uh, smartphone, the iPhone is just over 10 years old. Okay? And I'm old enough to remember when we did not have the internet. I remember... Uh, when making an international call, and I was in uh, Asia trying to make, when I came to the U.S. Uh, for study, when I had to make an international call, you had to make special arrangement. You have to go to an office and book the time, okay? And now you can make a, a, a connect to the rest of the world, to all your loved ones, to friends, to your professional societies and so on, just through your, your smartphone. This is from back then. It's... Nothing short of uh, being science fiction comes true. And it's due to the development in science and engineering and of which uh, cows were trying to play a role. So, so this is, uh, you are witnessing this uh, as we speak. And I think this theme, if you look at the program this time, you will hear uh, our Minister of Communication and Information Technology, His Excellency uh, Al Swaha, whom I know personally, uh, spoke about how this uh, connectivity is transforming 
the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, in particular, how the how business is going to be conducted, how the government conducts its business. Uh, you will hear later today. I'll be back with you to introduce the last speaker of today, Professor David Swite, and would, he will be talking about how connectivity affects talent, connectivity, how people are connected, how different countries are trying to attract talent from all over the world, and you will hear about that. In particular, he will talk about. Uh, I think China. I think in particular in the U.S. That's the title of his talk. Uh, you will sometime later in the program. I'll be back to introduce another person whom I know personally, and that's Professor Gabriel Leung from University of Hong Kong, and he is a leading expert on uh, on pandemics. He was involved with the SARS, with uh, the swine flu, and of course now with uh, COVID-19. And so you will hear about that. Uh, he has personal experience uh, with pandemics. Uh, uh, so, and then last but not least, I noticed that the last program this time is uh, a virtual concert by a musician called James Blunt. And I happen to, to actually know some of his music. So I look forward to that myself. So this sort of this year, uh, we have a very full and colorful program. So without further ado, I want to pass it back to uh, Hallett. I look forward to re-engage with you uh, later today and later in the program. And uh, please spread the word, tell your friends. This program is available to anybody uh, uh, around the world to listen in. And I want to also take the opportunity to thank all the speakers. This includes Cal's faculty, uh, in-kingdom speaker, as well as the global speakers. We hope after this year, uh, we'll be able to reconstitute the physical meeting so you will get to come to see the beautiful Cows campus. Thank you very much and welcome again. Halit, back to you. Thank you so much, Tony, for your inspiring uh, talk. We're always happy to hear you and to know about what's going on on campus and what are the new developments that's going on to make Cows bigger and better. Uh, with that, I'd like to come back to Professor Slema Elwini and Professor Boone, and we we'll hold some questions and answers regarding their talk. We had some questions, people shared questions, and we voted on that. So the first question I have is Professor Slim, is, is 5G safe for our health? People are worried about 5G, and they are hearing all sorts of talks online and conspiracy theories. What's your view on that? Yeah, this is uh, often uh, a question that uh, we are getting these days. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, wrong information going around, including these online claims linking uh, 5G ne network to, to coronavirus. Uh, and uh, as you may know, unfortunately, this led to arson attacks uh, against cellular infrastructure when it was mostly needed uh, uh, this past spring in several countries like the UK, Ireland and Australia. And obviously, as I mentioned in my talk, one has to worry about any possible health effect of radiation. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, all the serious research that has been done so far uh, is saying that we are operating below, you know, once you, if you operate below the strict limits that are regulated, uh, essentially the, there is no risk. As you know, the electromagnetic spectrum is broken into what we call the ionizing and non-ionizing part. Uh, ionize, uh, ionizing radiation... Uh, which include super high frequencies, uh, you know, these are, as you know, very tiny wavelengths, such as ultraviolet or X-ray or gamma rays, are, of course, dangerous. Uh, but we are not operating in the ionizing part of the, the spectrum, even, uh, you know, like uh, the microwave that are part of 5G or maybe terahertz that are going to be part of 6G are still part of the non-ionizing part of the spectrum, which means that essentially there is no, uh, you know, enough uh, energy to break the chemical bonds in DNA or damage cells or create, I mean, any kind of uh, uh, bad uh, uh, health effect from this perspective. Now, having said that, what is not known now is, is there some other biological effect beyond this non-ionizing, ionizing aspect? This has to be researched. More experiments have to be done by people in the biomedical kind of uh, world, people more medicine, to check if there are other kind of bio biological mechanism that can create uh, or can induce or can uh, lead to some bad health effect on the long term. But so far, uh, the evidence, uh, you know, we, we are operating under really very strict uh, regulation. And I believe uh, 
uh, you know, there is no uh, risks. And now, having said that, one last time, one, one last issue, which I mentioned in my talk, we can design networks that can provide pretty much the same level of performance, but with less, less EMF radiation. And that's what we are after. How can we basically maintain the same performance, but try to be, try to be more smart about EMF radiation? I, talked, I, I mentioned to you this kind of decoupling idea, but there are other ideas that uh, many people are pursuing these days. So we'll take it to Professor Bunoi, and the question is also about safety, and people are asking about how safe are optical communication using lasers. I mean, these are the most popular questions that people are worried about. So can you share with us your view on that? Yeah, thanks, Khalid. Uh, definitely, it's a very, very good question. Um, well, when people are talking about laser, um, we try to, well, we think that laser is uh, dangerous, but uh, the laser light that we are using is actually diffuse laser light that is not any higher intensity than um, the your sunlight, for example. Uh, I believe many of us um, been to concert before and in concert we use blue color, green color laser shooting everywhere. And I think um, we have, haven't witnessed any, 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 um, anyone got injured by the laser. So even using a narrow beam in underwater medium, the probability or chances of hitting onto any of the sea mammal uh, or the diver and et cetera, that can be relatively low in most of the uh, wavelength that we're using, even with the um, UV, B, UVA, for example, and that still has to be complied with the FDA. And FDA allows certain uh, fluence of the such a light to expose to um, human skin, for example. So um, if follow closely to the guideline, it can be relatively safe. Um, broadcast laser, if I happen to use a very high power laser in a laser lamp, for example, um, such as integrating onto car headlamp that we are using is above a few thousand so-called lumen. And in Europe, it's already passed the, um, it's, it's, it's a proof light source that can be used in the car headlamp by using laser light. If happen to use any high-end Audi or uh, BMW, you can uh, have these options of using the laser white light as a laser headlamp that you allow you to see uh, a longer distance. But of course, in FDA, uh, US-based FDA, North America is still not approved yet. So those, again, more research need to be done. Um, uh, and maybe the um, land maker uh, would have to either bring down the intensity or um, make it comply to the uh, FDA guideline. So that, that would be the, the, the step to take. Okay, so uh, Professor Slim, in your talk, you mentioned that it takes about 10 years for each generation for wireless communication from 2G to 3G to 4G and now 5G, and next is gonna be 6G. So this is a twofold question. The first question is what happens, I mean, in the for 6G, would it also take 10 years to get developed or since we are actually advancing in our technology, the cycle will be shorter. And the question would be, if the cycle is shorter, how will this affect the infrastructure? Because it does not make sense to keep renovating the infrastructure and spend billions of dollars if you are going to change the technology every three years or four years. So these are the questions that people are asking about. What do you feel about that? Yeah, okay. I mean, this can take a long, it's a, it's a long question and it can take a long time to answer all the issues, but let me try to answer it in, in, a, in a compact fashion. Uh, what I can say, if you look at historically how things evolve, it's exactly what I told you. It's about a 10 year cycle. Uh, and, uh, you know, if things continue as, as they have been over the last four or five decades, we expect 6G to be deployed by uh, on, 20, on 2030. But what I can say, what is different this year, this time than before, that we start talking about 6G a little bit too early. I remember, like when we, like for example, when we looked at 4G or 5G, like 5G, we start talking about it in maybe 2012, 2013. Uh, whereas here in 2019, we already started talking about 6G. So wireless communications become much more important, has much bigger kind of, uh, let's say, kind of. Uh, uh, footprint uh, and uh, it, it kind of drives many interests and uh, maybe we, we can make much more progress in a shorter time but you have to understand that within this cycle there are different steps 
So step one is the step we are living now, which is what I call a brainstorming step. A step where there are academics, researchers in industry, uh, people from all over, from this kind of wide spectrum uh, of research and uh, uh, in industry and academia, are thinking, are having a vision for 6G. Then we go to the second step, which is the ITU. You know, ITU writes a document, uh, for example, for 4G, it was called IMT Advanced. For 5G, it was IMT 2020. For 6G, maybe it's going to be called Network 2030. So this ITU document doesn't give a standard. It gives the vision that ITU sees for 6G. That's kind of trying to kind of, kind of summarize all this brainstorming, kind of rationalize it, and kind of think what is maybe realistic, what can be achieved within the next few years, and come up with this vision. Maybe that's going to happen, let's say, 2023, 2024. And then we have a few years after that to come up with the standard that is going to basically implement 6G. So maybe we, we can be two years, we can achieve 6G two years before. But at the end of the day, to be honest also, uh, the, the, this 5G, 6G, 7G maybe kind of terminology is needed for marketing uh, world. Because the way it evolved in practice, there are what we call 3GPP releases. And we are at, at, at release, for, I think, 15 or 16. This is in continuous process. And every time there is some kind of evolution and ad adaptation or improvement, there is a new release, and then this gets adapted. So, uh, and then, you know, essentially 4G gets improved to 4.5G, to 5G, then 5.5 will come and eventually we reach 6G expectation. So indeed, you know, 6G will have certain level of expectation, but this doesn't happen by pushing a button. Typically, it's a continuous progress over the coming 10 years. You know, it was a long answer for your question, but just to tell you, that's... Uh, it's not an easy uh, answer, but I try to kind of give you a different perspective on this issue. Okay, and the last question is for Professor Boon Uri. So, Li-Fi, or communication using light, has a very high data rate, and people are excited about the, how can you send movies very fast. But the big question is, how can you guarantee alignment of lasers, and how can you make sure that this data rate is sustainable and it's not gonna be cut due to occlusion or something like that? that that's a very good question. Um, yep, the Life 5 people have been talking about this technology in the past, uh, maybe 10 years or more than slightly more than 10 years now, uh, from uh, early 2000 until now. Um, it's still um, not fully deployed and, and implemented yet, uh, basically based on a couple of the couple of reasons. Uh, one is, of course, um, most of the industry will not invest in this technology until they'll be able to see the market need. And what you mentioned is definitely um, uh, valid. Um, we still have some technological problem to, to sort out. For example, um, if there's any, the link happened to be broken and uh, how are we gonna do it? And a solution is definitely still need the so-called uh, RF technology to serve as a backup link because when we need a very huge bandwidth, we can rely on light. But if the link is uh, blocked, for example, because the devices need to see light before we'll be able to uh, tap onto this huge bandwidth, if it happens to be blocked, then Wi-Fi technology, for example, will become the, um, the backup uh, sources. And also, um, the industry will have to see significantly improve. Uh, compared to the Wi-Fi technology. Wi-Fi technology is picking up really soon also. For LED-based Li-Fi, you now are talking about only slightly higher bit rate than the existing Wi-Fi. So for the uh, system provider to change all the, um, the system, invest in uh, their system and infrastructures to upgrade everything into Li-Fi might not happen. But uh, there is a hope because um, if everyone, uh, if um, for laser, laser definitely, laser-based life fi definitely have a few tens to hundreds of times X better than the LED life fi and that might be able to justify the investment. But again, uh, you still need RF technology as a backup, just in case the link, um, the uh, optical link is being, being interrupted. Thank you so much, uh, Boon, for the comprehensive answer, and thank you, Slim, for your insights about 6G and 5G.
And we're, with that, we'll go for the next part of our, and the final uh, part of our uh, today event. So I want to remind everyone that today we're going to have another keynote talk by Professor uh, Zwick, and he is coming from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He has been living in China and Hong Kong for the last, I think, 40, 50 years. And he's going to be telling us about how the development of uh, China to, uh, into a new science. How did they do it? How did they actually interact with the West in order to be able to connect, to bring all the discoveries from the West back to China? Uh, he is going to be talking about reverse immigration. In the past, people used to travel from China to the West. Now they are actually moving back to China. How, how is this uh, interconnection between the East and the West? How can we actually work together in order to actually move the humanity forward by actually sharing the science and we do not have any boundaries of science between the two countries? With that, I'd like to all join us uh, to, today for this talk. And please uh, take this time to disconnect from your daily activities. Take this time to actually connect with us in order to listen more and more about various things that you haven't heard before. This uh, event is going to hold talks which are uh, dark side of interconnectivity, the good side of connectivity. There are so many things that will appeal to everyone. All the sessions are being streamed uh, online on uh, Facebook and YouTube, so everyone can share, uh, can watch them. Please share them with your friends and keep in mind that we are holding actually prizes every day. So we'll be posting questions and the uh, ones who are going to be answering questions fast and right, we're going to be getting prizes from us. So make use of this opportunity to actually connect with us. With that, I thank you so much uh, for your time and wishing you a very good web. Thank you.